I want to start with your story. How did you got involved with NFTs in the first place or crypto in the first place, I guess? And how did the process of starting a company came about? Well, gosh, I have, my origin story goes back to the video game business. Uh, I've been in video games for 25 years. Uh, my, my partner is my husband. We've worked together for 25 years. Uh, we go back to the take two days where I co-founded 2K Games and 2K Sports. And um, my partner was a producer on some of the Grand Theft Auto titles and designed on Bully. And um, when we left take two, we were a two-person shop for a very long time. Um, and ran the games group at Paramount and did consulting projects with a number of different game publishers uh, before getting into free-to-play games. Uh, we uh, picked up the rights to Doctor Who and did a successful free-to-play mobile game called Doctor Who Legacy many years ago, um, <clears throat> if you're a Doctor Who fan. And then we got into augmented reality uh, about four years ago. So we tend to like new tech, I guess. It's probably like the, the theme of our career is new tech. My partner has very creative ideas and I figure out a way for us to, you know, make them happen and raise money and, and, and build product. Um, and then uh, about two and a half years ago, we were coming out of the back of this heavy R&D AR stuff that we were doing. And uh, we decided to build Pediverse um, specifically because we wanted um, to build a next generation digital pet that wouldn't be confined to any one experience. And so when you think about digital pets, you know, they started with Tamagotchis about 30 years ago, <clears throat> which were, you know, simple and confined to an, an experience and to a you know, device. And then Nintendogs made that a richer experience, but they were confined to the DS. They were confined to Nintendogs. They were confined even to that art style. And, um, and they were solo, a solitary experience, all these things. Roblox, about 10 years later, um, had Adopt Me and uh, Pet Simulator, and they became social experiences confined to Roblox, though. And so for us, we wanted to, to, to step beyond those bounds and give you your last digital pet, the pet that would always be yours, that you'd never have to worry about losing access to. That can be taken with you wherever you wanted it to go. And that's what we set out to build two and a half years ago. Um, and, it, and since that time, we've built uh, a full animation system for, for pets, starting with cats, um, a whole variety of different types of rich features like AR and VR and chat GPT. And, um, and we're about to launch the game um, in the next few months, um, which is going to bring all that together. But um, that's how we ended up in Web3 for very purest reasons, because we know that Web3 um, is what allows for immortalization, I, I like to call it, the idea that something will always be yours and that you can be you know, empowered with the things that you need to, to not rely on a publisher, to not rely on a piece of hardware, to not rely on an art style, that we could, we could be part of pioneering that. That was why we got into blockchain. Not specifically for NFTs, but because of the, the provenance of the blockchain. What was the inspiration behind, like, building specifically or solving specifically that particular problem of, like, you know, having a digital pet that you can own and always have made with you? Uh, I, I was fascinated by AR at the time and interoperability. You know, I saw, um, and you know, Apple is showing now that AR is very much on the, the future of society. You know, the idea of AR glasses, we're not there yet. And at $3,500, it's obviously going to take a bit of time until we get there. But I know it's coming and I've known it's coming. And um, and my team is, is, is very skilled in that area. And... So it was important for me to think about a way of building now for that future. Um, and so we realized that if we were thoughtful about how we built these digital companions, that we could make interoperability possible in a way that everyone was saying it wasn't. And because I said to my partner, how do we build a pet using LiDAR from Apple and, and having it jump up on surfaces and running off around the corner and all these pets are so much a part of our lives. They're a global connector. Everyone understands pets, no matter where you live, your economics, your geography, whatever it is, we all have cats and dogs or other types of pets. And I think that's fascinating. And it's why the physical pet business is like $200 billion. And so I think that digital pets are something safe and comforting and reassuring and I think that that's why they're always a part of the adoption of new technologies. We understand them. We understand the, the need to have a companion. And so that was why we started with pets, because we felt that pets were something accessible like that, that people can understand and bond with. 
and um, that that could be the beginnings of, of interoperability. So when we think about interoperability, we think about some fundamental questions. Everyone's games look different, and people say that that's why interoperability is stupid because you can't bring a Call of Duty skin into Tomb Raider. It would look, it wouldn't match. You know, fundamentally, just wouldn't match. And um, so we took this data-driven approach to it, this Web three data-driven approach, and said if we could, um, if we could come up with a blueprint for a pet. Think of a loot NFT project. If we come up with a blueprint for a pet and define their personality and their behavior and their inventory and their memories and and basically the the soul of the pet. You could you could call that any art style you wanted. It's just a it's like a prompt in Dali. Um, now reinterpret it in anime. Now reinterpret it in um, as text. Now reinterpret it in high fidelity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we could think about um, pets and interoperable assets the same way. And so we have defined an open standard for digital pet that we're encouraging others to adopt as well. And if you want to bring it into a game where our art style doesn't match, then you're free to reinterpret it and assign different art, you know, to that pet. Um, and by the same token, we, um, we also think that as blockchain hits adoption, you're going to see a lot of different blockchains. We already do. And different games are going to adopt different, different databases, right, to store their assets on. And so we felt that there as well, interoperability was, was important. And so we've taken a, a hybrid Web 2, Web 3 solution to how we think about uh, this metadata. And we've created what you might think of as a universal safe file. So if you mint your pet on Ethereum... We'll let you use it any 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 blockchain you want. We can create a non-tradable copy of your NFT and give you permission to use it on Solana or give you permission to use it on Aptos or, or wherever else. And so this becomes a universal safe file. So whatever game you're bringing it into, whatever blockchain it is, it's still checking the same source of truth and updating the same source of truth. And so we think that's really important to interoperability. And lastly, the, the tech to go with it. It's it's all fine and well to say that your thing is interoperable, but a, a developer needs stuff to make that happen. The model, the rig, the animations, the you know the the the, the nuts and bolts of building an experience. And so we're going to hand that off too, and let everyone use our tech stack. And so with those boxes ticked, you know we we theorize that interoperability is definitely possible, and like now, not in the future, like immediately. Is it is it def- difficult to get the you know? open source, uh, when you're trying to be the standard open source Web3 standard, is it difficult mm-hmm. to get adoption for that? And how do you- Well, it starts with us, right? And if we're right, and if it works, then you know we hope that others will want to collaborate with us because because that's the point. We're not trying to control it. And not only that, it's it's updatable. So if the, I'm, I'm sure that there are other things that someone might want to know about a pet to bring it into a game, and we can update everyone's metadata to reflect that. Like we started with personality and behavior and uh, elemental abilities, D and D morality, um, you know, and so forth, and all these things are called out in the text of the memories of how they problem solve can be can be put in there. Who designed it? Can, it can be autographed essentially in the metadata. And so, if in the future someone wanted to, let's say, add another element to the standard, we can update the metadata to support that. And so, um, we just think this is what's going to take. And this is what's wonderful about Web three is there's such a, a desire to collaborate and to work together, and because we may as well stay in web two if we're all just going to be at odds with each other about how we think about it. When you say that interoperability between for these pets, is it bridging it between different blockchains or is it something else? Well, that's, so that's what I mean. We, we think bridging is, is complicated and confusing and for gamers, they're, they're not going to want to touch that. And so we've, while you could bridge our assets between blockchains, we don't think it's necessary. So we uh, have this hybrid approach where we have um, metadata that is off chain. On chain, we store the information that allows us to to recreate your pet should anything happen to it. So it's secured on the blockchain, but we've pushed the metadata off chain and to make it a shared source of truth so that there's no need to bridge it. You can simply create a copy of it in those places. We call it our passporting system. And it means if I want to use it in the game on Solana, I can use the same exact NFT, but I have a non-tradable, non-copyable, non-breedable copy of it. It's just permission. It's not an actual NFT. So how do you explain um, the Petaverse, the product, and, and these games that are coming out? I guess, what, can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, what we've built is a, is a, a tech stack that allows us to create anything that you could think of in terms of what you'd want to do with the pets. There's what we're building. And then, you know, the third key area of blockchain to me is ownership 
interoperability and composability, being able to be empowered to build new things with what you have. And so we hope that the community is going to rally and, and make cool things as well. But the core of Petaverse coming this fall is going to be our Tamagotchi stroke Nintendogs experience. And so a user will be able to come to Petaverse.com and now they're going to see their pet, the pet that they already own if they bought one, or they're going to be able to build a pet using an editor and they're going to see the low poly browser version of their pet. Same metadata, different art interpretation of it. It's the same one that's in VR. And your pet is going to tell you what they need. And we use chat GPT integration to let your pet define its needs for you. Tamagotchi style. And, and you'll be able to play mini games right there within the browser to keep your pet happy. But then you're going to have the opportunity to take your pet into richer features like these things that we've already released, like AR, VR, bringing your pet with you onto your Google Meet, bringing it onto your Twitch stream and letting the users interact with it. But it's all the same pet. It's a cloud-based experience in the sense that there's, there's one pet and regardless of where you bring it, it's the same needs. So if you go into VR and feed your pet and you go into a different feature, it's been fed already. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a first of its kind in our mind in terms of how we think about digital pets. But um, we, you know, it's in, in terms of fulfilling a pet's needs, it's about mini games and there's all variety of experiences that we either have or plan to, to deliver, as well as other types of pets. Cats are first, but we already have the next type of pet, which we haven't announced well along in development. And, um, and a number of partners coming together. Like we have a big focus on partnerships right now. Uh, we think that there are a lot of Web2 companies in particular that want to get into you know, the metaverse, whatever that means you know, to everybody. And to, to me, it means this digital universe, this untethered digital universe. And so we're going to be working with a number of different brands to provide them a, an onboarding into the metaverse that isn't about just Web3. It can be Web2. It can be, I want to take my pet into all these experiences. Later, you can upgrade it to an NFT. Later, you can immortalize it, essentially. And I think that this is really important to the mass market is we have to, we have to lead them to the water, not drown them in it. And our space is, a, is an absolute train wreck of scams right now. And it's just, just one after the next. And it's like it's almost like we don't deserve to be loved right now. <laughs> if, if I wasn't in Web3, I'd probably be a skeptic too, you know, but, but, but I'm here. And I know that there are people who actually really want to be here for the right reasons. And I know that there are so many wonderful things that we can build. But we, now it's time to prove it. And we're going to prove that with a Web2 first approach that gives them the opportunity to make that decision. And I think that that's a trend that we're going to see this year is this notion of web 2.5. Um, you know, the, the maxis are really going to be kind of our death knell. It doesn't have to all be web three. We can, we can, that can be a goal to work towards. So uh, where are we right now? Um, you, see, you mentioned a bunch of things. You mentioned partnerships, you mentioned, you know, the games are coming out. Like what's like, what, what's the, does the next, yeah, like next six to 12 months look like? And yeah, like what's, because uh, you, you guys have been building for two and a half years now, right? So. Yes, yes. And we have, we have, we have uh, some holders out there who have NFTs on Ethereum who are able to bring our pets into all these experiences and beta testing for us and, and active um, in, in all these different experiences. Uh, in the next few months, we're gonna be launching the, the game that allows everyone a, a reason to, to play these features because you'll be able to earn, um, earn points and use them to unlock accessories and things that you can bring you know, with your pet. It's part of their wardrobe. It's part of their, their metadata, whether or not they're an NFT, it's part of their metadata, their underlying data. Um, and, uh, and we'll be onboarding partnerships and we'll be releasing the next pet. So it's, we've got a lot, you know, we're about, we're 26 people, uh, about half of that is engineering. And, um, you know, right now it's all hands on deck releasing the, the Petiverse game. Um, so we're, we're really excited about, about where things are going. I'm trying to like wrap my head around like the, the user flow of this. Mm -hmm. So like when you're a new user, like, are you starting on Ethereum? Not at all. Because I'm trying to understand how the interoperability of off-chain and on-chain and everything. Sure, yeah. So a new user who comes into Petiverse.com who didn't buy a Genesis Ethereum pet, um, who is, is, is new and just wants a pet. Like, we're not going to throw the NFT at them at all. They're going to simply be able to build a pet with an editor right there in the browser. They can make their pet. Um, that pet isn't theirs yet. They have to prove themselves. They have to take care of their pet in typical Tamagotchi fashion. And when they've proven themselves, it's now theirs. So this isn't a free NFT in the sense of what you're seeing out there where something's being given for free and they speculate with it. I want someone to earn it. If they can't pay for it, they need to earn it. And so that's, you know, and which is perfect for taking care of a pet. Prove you can take care of it. Prove you can come back consistently. And if you don't, you lose it. And if you do, you keep it in a Web2 sense. 
And now you can use these other features. And so you can take it beyond the constraints of just the browser into an app, into your VR headset, onto your Twitch stream and so forth. And then that will unlock subscriptions where you can, you know, to, to use these additional features. Where it becomes Web3 if you didn't purchase an Ethereum NFT is later if you decide that you want to upgrade it and that you might want to do that because you want to sell it. You might want to do it um, because there's a game you want to bring it into that needs to query the blockchain to know that you own it. Um, you know, so there, there are reasons, but it's going to be on us to articulate those reasons. But for a user who comes in who does not trust Web3 yet, this can be a Web2 experience for them for, with, with, with full interoperability within our experiences. You guys uh, have had some really big investors in the space, like Animoca and Dapper. Um, are you guys like talking about partnerships? What kind of experience has it been chatting with them about just like building games? Obviously, you have so much experience building games already, but I'm just curious, like how has that kind of helped or how incentives aligned and whatnot? Yeah, uh, we have great investors. Uh, Fabric Ventures uh, led our seed round and Animoca is one of our larger investors as well. Um, our seed round was almost entirely Web3, uh, which was really exciting. You know, it was, you know, it was in the middle of the bull market and um, there, we didn't really need help on the game development side. Um, we really wanted to dig in at that time and nail our blockchain strategy, you know, which we did, which wasn't in any way wasted time because it's, it's a fundamental part of what we built now. And we may remain as convinced as ever, you know, how, how important that is. Uh, Animoca has been great and they've gotten really active with all their portfolio companies. You know, we're all on a Slack together. They host events for us and really try to be additive and, and supportive and get this sort of ecosystem. They funded all these companies, you know, um, they're trying to get everyone working together and talking together, which has been really, really great. Yeah. Um, you know, Dapper are, have been really good friends of ours as well. Dapper introduced us to probably a third of our investors. So um, they've been very kind to us on the investment side um, as well. And, you know, we're big fans of Crypto Kitties. We consider it like the grandfather of this project. Bring it up, yeah. In so many ways. Like, look, Kittyverse is what this started life as, right? If, if Crypto Kitties had been more than JPEGs, Kittyverse should have, you know, really should have worked. We're trying to we're trying to make that happen now, and so you know I, I we have a lot of friends on the Crypto Kitties team who are still involved, and we would very much love to breathe new life into Crypto Kitties, you know, in, in terms of finding a home within the Petaverse project and being able to. We've always loved the idea of being able to create you a new Petaverse pet that respects the metadata of your Crypto Kitty, and so I think that that's something you'll probably see us do in the future. Very cool. Um, well, when you were chatting about like you know you were talking about the trend of AR, and you you kind of saw it coming again because you started building two and a half years ago so i'm sure you have been like thinking about this for quite a long time now um what made you think that i'm just very curious because i always like you know when people are like um thinking about a trend it could be three years it could be 10 years right so if you're building a company you have to survive that long until that trend hits right so what gave you the conviction to one um start the company at that time because you know what if it took five years for ar to happen for example right um and second for someone like yourself and your and your partner you guys have so much experience in gaming what is the future of gaming look like from your perspective so in the first one so tiny rebel uh, has been around for uh, about 15 years now uh, we started as a U.S. company, and then when we moved to the U.K. about seven years ago, we set up our U.K. company. Um, so, uh, so the company wasn't new. Uh, AR for us, we were very fortunate. Um, back in 2018, we we bid for and won uh, a very lucrative grant in the U.K. from uh, a, a program called Audience of the Future. And so, my partner and I bid for and led um, a grant project with several other companies and with Ardman, the creators of Wallace and Gromit. And we spent about five million dollars over the course of a few years building out like bleeding edge um, AR experiences, um, which got us on Apple's radar and, and Qualcomm and Meta. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work within AR. We've, uh, Meta had us consult, Qualcomm made us one of their first Snapdragon Spaces partners. Uh, Deutsche Telekom and Apple had us in an incubator regarding LiDAR. Um, so we had already had the AR expertise coming into Petaverse. Petaverse is not an AR project, even though that's the future. You know, it's going to take time to get there. It's going to take mass market pricing. They have to look more like this than look like, you know, wearables that, you know, goggles um, so that you can have them out and about. Like in the future, you know, it's part of, it's going to be part of our lives, right? You know, we talk about games, but I imagine a pet's going to lead me to a restaurant instead of Google arrows. I imagine I'm going to go out jogging 
And my dog is going to know how fast I should run and encourage me to keep up. And, and so it'll just become fundamental to our lives. So I've always been convinced of that, but Pediverse was never about that. Only one of our experiences right now uses AR and that's the Mimatron. And the Mimatron is, isn't a game, it's a feature around social media sharing, like creating content with your, you know, your unique NFT pet and being able to share that, those videos and photos to social media. Um, so nothing about us requires AR. And I don't, and I think that will always be the case until there are ubiquitous glasses. And then I think that you'll see this, that being a fundamental core of this project. But for now, AR is a feature. Um, as for games, whew, games are struggling right now. You know, everything is struggling right now. Look, we were in a big bubble because of the pandemic. Everything went through the roof. Everyone was stuck at home. So people were playing games and, you know, doing all these things. And now life coming back to normal in some ways, coupled with a war and and coupled with, you know, all the scams, you know, with FTX and everything else. Everything is just a bit of a train wreck right now, as we all know. Um, and so games are, are have not been unscathed by that because, you know, it's back to being realistic unit sales and stuff. And it sucks. I'm seeing a lot of game developers, you know, laying people off. It's the same problems Web3 teams are having, game companies are having. It's just it's hard to raise, raise money. Um, and so, uh, but I think that user generated content will continue to be really important. It's why it's so important to us and why I think that's a big part of blockchain is empowering people to be able to build. Uh, and it's cheaper to have people create the content for you. You know, it's a, it's a great business model. It's very expensive creating games. You know, everyone has seen the kind of the costs of making Grand Theft Auto now and games like that are just ins insane amounts of money between product and marketing. So I think you'll see UGC continue to be you know, fundamentally important to that. I think that blockchain gaming will happen in a sense that the blockchain aspects of owning your stuff and being able to, you know, extract value if you leave, I think all of that's going to be important and a big part of games. I don't think play to earn can or should ever return. <laughs> um, you know, I just think we have to change how we think about it. I think that it's unfortunate that all of this started with NFTs and speculation and game developers came in and tried to conform to these same norms, you know, launching an NFT before a product, worrying about floor price, worrying about minting out, worrying about FOMO and selling out and, and, and what happens. None of that's conducive to making games. Like we just need to throw out that playbook and create our own is what I think. You know, you were talking about the digital pet guiding you in like with AR glasses. It kind of reminded me of, this is like 25 years ago, and I can't remember the name. You might remember this uh, because you were in the this, in this space quite a bit. But like there was this, when you would open your computer, like uh, like a Microsoft, and there was this. this... Clippy. Yeah, Clippy, Clippy. There you go. Oh, I was, I was thinking about it. Yeah. Funny, funny story. One of my, my first investors uh, is a guy named Ed Freeze. Ed launched the Xbox. He's a, like an icon of the game industry. His sister worked on Clippy. And when I told no him way. what we were going to no do, when we talked about the project, he told me this story. I, I've known him for 25 years. I'd never known that his sister did this. But yeah, look, Clippy, you know, pissed a lot of people off, you know, who didn't want this paper clip <laughs> popping up. But, but fundamentally, you know, it's, it's really interesting, right? And I, I do think that our digital pet needs to be a part of your life in that way. I had, I've had some of our community say that they would love if their pet told them they were late for a meeting. You know, I'm like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. And I have it on your desktop or if you, you know, tells you you're late for a meeting and you go outside and you look at your smartwatch and there's your cat because it comes with you. Like, and, and so it becomes even better than a physical pet because it can just go with you everywhere. It can go into restaurants. Kind of what I'm kind of understanding, like uh, at least um, thinking about onboarding, for example, is like being done in a very animated and like a fun way and also like notifications yeah. and whatnot we become it's become so businessy but like or like so like sorry yeah, I don't know what the right word here is but but with pets or with any kind of character you're basically building a relationship and they're showing you around they're guiding you it's more of a fun kind of um fun kind of like a, a vibe where you're figuring something out in a, in a playful manner it's kind of how i think yeah. i'm kind of thinking about it absolutely uh Tyler, i want to quickly talk about security is there anything else that you want to cover I'm just thinking about like the actual cats themselves. So like when you first start, is every cat kind of equal? And the only way to kind of make it better is to kind of play the games and add on to it. It's not like someone can come and like get lucky and start off with like some really good uh, cat or pet. Yeah. So they're, they're dynamic. You know, that's one of the interesting things about, again, about this approach that we've taken to metadata is that our metadata is mutable. And, you know, so similar to an MMO, you can spend time and invest in your pet and have it become, you know, collect things and collect 
you know, uh, points for doing quests and collect inventory and so forth and level up and all of that. So, you know, you, you could potentially buy someone's pet and buy your way into that the same way that someone you know, would buy an EverQuest or a World of Warcraft account because they, they didn't want to put the time in. So, Done. yes, um, you know, on the Ethereum side, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's um, what you'd expect in terms of rarity there. You know, they, they go for they, the top end is, is legendary and um, they, you know, they look really cool in a way that look, the mass market, I think, is going to want their cat, you know, like the, the tabby cat that they might have. Our Ethereum cats are about, you know, cool metallic cats or Ethereum branding on them. And, you know, one of them looks like Spider-Man and things like that. So they're quirky, you know, and a bit more about the Web3 aesthetic. So there's rarity built into that. And in fact, those rarity tiers define how many characteristics are there in their DNA. So a legendary cat has more features in terms of personality and behavior than a common pet and so so there's that but some of these things will be things that you'll be able to to change over time um and um and train over time so i want to quickly talk about security um mm. how important is security in the petaverse universe oh it's well super important i'm both in a web 2 and a web 3 you know standpoint where it came to uh you know our ethereum nfts that's you know that's why we work with quantstamp you know because that was super important to us especially because it was our first uh, Web3 launch. And, you know, we know how fraught they are with scams and problems and stuff. So we, uh, because, you know, our CTO, Dan, comes from the Web2 world and has, you know, 30, 30 years of software development experience, we had certain expectations coming into it that, you know, Web3 doesn't. You know, there's a lot that's broken, as you guys know, in Web3. And so there's certain things that we're like, we didn't like the way they were. So it's like, well, that needs to be better. And and so, but yeah, I think security is super important. And, and for us, you know, now, this, if this is going to be your immortal pet, that's incredibly important. I mean, that would be devastating, the notion that you could, uh, you know, up immortalize it on the blockchain and then lose it. So I think it's fundamentally like the biggest part of blockchain is that security of really believing that something is yours. That's awesome. And what was the experience you know, like? Still, there's, and there's still so many problems, you know, people are getting scammed constantly. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm friends with the, the founder of uh, Plague NFT Palms, and I, I, as just a token of support, I bought one of his, uh, his NFTs, and immediately found out that someone had scammed it, and uh, right. in the Discord, I gave it back to the guy who was very grateful. Suddenly, I had a lot of Plague NFT following me because I just gave it back, and you know, it wasn't like it was five ETH that had been like 0.2 ETH, but I think I think we all need to have each other's back. Uh, as, be as best we can when it's possible. And I just hated to see that. This was a guy, it was his first NFT ever. I like, it was the reason, you know, it was his first thing in space and it was stolen. Like, mm -hmm. It just sucked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's very important. Especially for people who are not as um, uh, new in the space or not as, like, educated about the space. Yeah, talk about a way to, to kill people off quickly is to come into yeah. the space, to save up, to buy an NFT and then have it stolen. It's like, you're never going to come back. Yeah. What was your experience like going through an audit? We were a bit removed from the process. Um, so, uh, but it, it was it was interesting to me because I know that you guys pointed out certain things here and there that uh, were especially related to how we store metadata on and off chain and thinking about non-tradable copies and passports and stuff. There were a lot of questions asked about that, which was great because I think it helped us to do everything in the in the right way.